good afternoon from Cairo, uh, Cairo, Egypt. This is Ala Shaheen from Derby uh, Development Assistance Roadmap Portal of the Middle East. Derby is a platform in which it shares information for tender, tenders and grants opportunities, as well as information on partnership opportunities. Uh, Derby platform is uh, today is pleased to, to host uh, Grant Challenges Canada uh, to, uh, to present, uh, we facilitate, we, we give the space uh, and we are happy to have Grant Challenges Canada to uh, speak about their uh, current request for a proposal, request for application for grants under uh, creating hopes in conflict areas. This is a great, a great uh, initiative with a great project that Grand Challenges Canada is championing by serving those in need uh, and who are suffering from conflicts in the region and the whole uh, the world actually, and specifically in the Middle East and North Africa region amid current circumstances. So, uh, uh, and this is an information session webinar and the objective of this webinar for you guys, now we have about 110 people attending and the number is increasing for you, uh, for, for, for all attendees, uh, uh, to, uh, for all attendees to, uh, to understand more about the request for proposal, the requirements of Grand Challenges, Challenges Canada, and what are the more the, the, the major uh, uh, winning themes and messages that uh, Grand Challenge conflict and uh, hope, uh, creating uh, hopes in conflict uh, may require. And this information session should uh, give you more understanding about the, the RFP. We still have a month to submit a, a, a proposal uh, for this very interesting project and very interesting client who can work with you shoulder to shoulder. I would like to invite uh, Mr. Patrick uh, from, uh, we have three, actually three people from Grand Challenge Canada, Patrick uh, uh, Coburn, who is uh, the, the lead of this presentation and he will talk about the RFP, he will walk you through. We have Ala, Ala El Filah, and she is as well from Grand Challenge Canada and we have Ziba Tassi from Grand Challenges, Challenges Canada. Uh, Patrick, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and share your slides and start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alain, and welcome to, to everybody who's joined uh, online for this uh, information session on how to apply for funding for creating hope in conflict, a humanitarian grand challenge. Um, my name is Patrick Coburn, um, and I oversee the operations of the program, uh, including this, the application intake and review process, as well as supporting um, our innovators um, who do receive funding throughout the course of their project period. Um, so, uh, Ala, just uh, wondering if um, we need um, for Zeba to be able to share her screen. Are you able to, to do that? Uh, Zeba, uh, you don't know? Uh, yes, I, I sure I will. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, Zeba, you can share your screen. Can you share your screen, Zeba, now? Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, we see it. Yeah, can, can you, can, have you shared it? Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not able to see it at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I yes. Think, here we go, thank you. Yes. yes. We can see Great. it now, yes. Um, excellent, um, thank you for that. So, um, what, what we're going to, to present during this session is I'm, I'm going to give an overview of the Humanitarian Grand Challenge program. Um, we're then going to talk about um, the areas of focus that, that our program looks at. I'll give a, a summary on, on the review process and the evaluation criteria. Um, we'll talk about how to apply and then at the end um, we'll have some time for, for questions um, from the audience. Um, so let's uh, just begin um, just by saying who we are. So our program is a partnership between uh, the United States Agency for International Development, the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
um, supported by Grand Challenges Canada. Um, so here at Grand Challenges Canada, we're an independent, not-for-profit corporation. Um, similar in structure to a foundation. Um, we recently marked our 10th anniversary, and, and over those years, we've supported a pipeline of uh, over a thousand innovations um, in more than 80 countries. So if we move on to the next slide, um, I'd like to talk about the, the problem that, that we, we seek to address through our program. So the latest figures from uh, the Global Humanitarian Overview state that over 168 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. And among the most vulnerable are those living in conflict zones where really traditional forms of humanitarian aid delivery are, are not able to reach. So our program uh, conducted a consultation process that involved conflict affected communities, it involved innovators, private sector actors, um, United Nations and humanitarian agencies and non-government organizations. Um, and in that process, we, we discussed what are the greatest needs um, in the humanitarian um, setting. So after that process, um, you know, we, we're now um, looking for innovations that have the potential to create wider transformative changes within the humanitarian sector and specifically in the areas of safe water and sanitation, alternative forms of energy, life-saving information and health supplies and services um, to help conflict affected people. So the innovations that we fund must involve input from affected communities that they seek to serve and as, as you may know from the, the request for proposals, we are giving preference to locally led solutions. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, we're also very interested in innovations that um, can engage the private sector as a way to increase um, the potential for, for scale and sustainability of, of these solutions. So if we move to the next slide, um, this is, this is a representation of our portfolio so far, so the projects that we've funded to date. And as you can see on this graphic, um, through two rounds of funding, we've, we've funded uh, 52 innovations uh, in 23 countries, including projects in the Middle East in places such as Syria and Yemen. Um, and uh, additional context here is that um, the innovations that we fund vary in terms of their stage of development. So some are very early stage, uh, new innovations that have previously been untested. Um, so these are seed stage projects and others within the portfolio and, and that we're seeking through this call will be more fully developed and proven to be effective and are now ready to be scaled up. So these are the transition to scale um, projects. So what I'd like to do, um, I mentioned earlier the, the four areas that are the focus of our program. Um, I'd like to just um, briefly summarize what, what these uh, entail. So for safe water and sanitation, we're looking for innovations that can address challenges in clean water supply and access. So, you know, within these types of settings, in conflict affected settings, there might be a, any number of reasons why water is inaccessible to the population. So it could be changing revenue and expenditure patterns um, within the community and at municipal levels. It could be an increase in population size, there could be a lack of power sources, or there may be climate factors such as droughts or floods um, that, that impact access to water. And even when water is available, conflict affected communities may have to walk long distances, often at great personal risk, to reach the source, um, which may then even be polluted. So safe water and sanitation, we're looking for innovations that can address challenges in getting access to clean water. Um, just an important clarification note here for, for this particular category is that we are not accepting early stage solutions for safe water and sanitation. So we're only accepting the more developed transition to scale applications um, for solutions that have already been proven and that are ready to scale up. Um, so just an important note for that particular category. Um, the next one is health supplies and services. So for, for this category, we're looking for innovations that address barriers related to healthcare infrastructure um, and healthcare workers. So um, in um, under-resourced settings and healthcare facilities uh, are often vulnerable to attack um, and have limited access to healthcare management technology. Um, 
healthcare workers in, in these areas sometimes uh, or very often are, are affected by the crises themselves and may not be able to respond, which leads to further depletion of, of um, formal and informal healthcare staff. Um, remaining staff may require capacity building too to address new, different unfamiliar diseases and injuries that occur in these types of conflict settings, um, as well as um, capacity building in, in adhering to humanitarian principles. Um, so that's uh, what we're looking for there um, as potential problems that, that can be addressed through our, uh, our program. For the next category, life-saving information, we're looking for innovations that address barriers in, in two-way communication. So um, what we're talking about here is that um, two-way communication um, can often be difficult to achieve in humanitarian settings. So communities are constantly requested to provide information um, to responders. However, the response um, and feedback from the community can often be overlooked um, by those who are um, providing humanitarian assistance. So this can lead to, to mistrust and frustration um, within the community and, and which can affect the overall response. So we're looking for innovations that can um, improve two-way communication between communities and humanitarian responders. The fourth category is energy. So for this one, we're looking for innovations relating to the provision of alternative uh, energy sources. Um, so, you know, commonly power supply within conflict settings is unreliable, um, it's underdeveloped and it's expensive. It's also subject to attack um, and is, you know, often insufficient um, to meet the needs of affected populations. Um, and in particular, um, infrastructures such as schools, hospitals, marketplaces. So we're looking for innovations that can provide alternative, more reliable sources of energy. Um, what I'd like to also emphasize that across all of these four areas is our focus on supporting locally led projects. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we, we are aiming to give preference to projects that are, are led from um, people who are within the community. So we believe that those that are affected by conflict are the best place to deliver the solutions that are needed. Um, they have contextual knowledge and connections to the communities and uh, are often well placed to reach those communities in, in insecure settings. But what we know is that traditionally um, in the humanitarian sector, they, they lack the funding and the resources to implement solutions. So if we move to the next slide, I um, want to emphasize that we have two distinct streams of funding. So we have um, what we call seed funding, um, which as I mentioned are, are new ideas that are untested. So these are uh, funding of up to 250,000 Canadian dollars over 18 month period. And then we have um, the second stream, which is transition to scale. So these are proven, fully developed ideas that are now ready to, to scale up. So we, we have funding available of up to 3 million Canadian dollars per project over, again, a period of 18 months. Um, as well as uh, receiving funding, awardees will also have the opportunity to um, receive capacity building support um, that, that can help increase the likelihood of success. So possible areas of support um, include publicity and marketing, um, networking events, mentorship opportunities, and support in, in partnership brokering. So I'd like now to um, give an overview of the review process once you've submitted an application. So all eligible applications will first go through um, the first stage of the review process, which is called the innovation screen. <clears throat> this is where project summaries from each application. So what we're talking about here is the first part of the application form for seed and the concept note um, form for transition to scale. These are rated on, on two core criteria. So firstly, we look at is the idea relevant? So is it relevant to the challenge that, that we are um, talking about? Does it address one or more of the four focus areas that I've just described? And does it focus on communities affected by conflict? And it, again, is it locally led? <clears throat> the second criteria is on innovation. So here we're looking at, is the proposed solution truly innovative? 
And what we mean is, is it a substantially new approach um, to addressing the problem? And does it represent a significant improvement over current approaches? And what I'd like to, to point out here at this first stage of the review process, last year over 70% of all of the applications received were removed from the competition at this stage because they, they lacked innovation and they lacked relevance towards um, the challenge. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that it's extremely important to have a very clear and compelling project summary section of, of your application form. So with the two separate streams, there's also slightly different um, review criteria um, from seed and transition to scale. So at this um, initial uh, screening stage, transition to scale um, concept notes are also assessed on their potential for impact, um, the evidence that, that it is a proven concept, and their scale and sustainability plan. So as well as the two criteria of relevance and innovation, we also look at these areas for transition to scale project applications. So those that sufficiently meet the criteria will proceed to the next stage. So for seed funding, those that pass this initial screen are analyzed in detail by a panel of experts. So the panel is made up of a hugely diverse um, uh, personnel. So we have um, subject matter experts, we have ethics specialists, we have private sector professionals, and probably most importantly, we have people with lived experience of conflict. So each application that makes it through to this stage is reviewed by four panelists and one from each of these perspectives um, that I've mentioned. <clears throat> the transition to scale stream, um, the concept notes um, that are most highly rated at stage one will then be invited to submit a full application form, which will then undergo um, further um, analysis by our team and additional expert analysis from subject matter experts. Um, so only the, the best of these will then be given an opportunity to move to stage three, which is only relevant for the transition to scale, which is our investment committee stage. So at the investment committee, um, it's an opportunity for the applicant to present their idea and, and pitch it to the committee to get their, um, their funding approval. So this committee is comprised of individuals who have <clears throat> expertise in, in investing in research um, in global health and in humanitarian context. Um, so as I said, those shortlisted um, for this stage will present their ideas with the hope of convincing the committee to recommend them for funding for the, for the larger transition to scale award. So I'll move on now to um, providing a summary on the evaluation criteria um, that, that we look at um, for, for those that move through from stage one. Um, so the full details of this criteria are in the um, request for proposals um, that's on our website. Um, and I'd recommend um, all of you who are interested in applying to review them very carefully um, before going ahead. I'll go through them now briefly. Um, so the first criteria is around potential for impact. So um, at the seed stage, so for the smaller um, early stage awards, our reviewers will be looking at the extent to which um, the proposal has potential to, to generate impact through life-saving or life-improving assistance for vulnerable people in conflict-affected areas. The transition to scale um, stage, so the larger awards, reviewers will also be looking at um, the proof of concept for the proposed solution. And what we mean is the evidence um, that is presented that the solution works and that there is sufficient demand for it. Um, across both streams of funding um, under the impact um, criteria, um, reviewers will ask whether the proposed solution is appropriate for wider implementation in complex settings. They'll look at whether the proposed idea um, applies to the most vulnerable people and um, has potential to address inequalities that exist. Um, they'll also look at whether it adheres to humanitarian principles and whether it has the potential to um, create systems change within the humanitarian sector. So does it have potential to sort of transform the way that humanitarian aid is currently um, provided for the specific problem you're, you're looking at? Um, for the next category, um, 
this is a, a concept called integrated innovation. Um, and for this, um, reviewers will look at whether proposals are, um, are bold and, and novel, um, so whether there, it's something new um, and, and a sufficient change from what's, what already exists. And they'll look at the extent to which the proposal combines um, the areas of science and technology innovation with social and business innovation. Um, so um, there's further explanation in, in the request for proposals on our definition of this. Um, so, so again, I'll draw your attention to that. Um, they'll also look at whether uh, affected people have been meaningfully engaged in the design and testing and iterating of the proposed innovation. The next criteria is on the implementation plan for the project. So for the early stage um, seed um, applications, reviewers will determine whether the project plan is appropriate um, and um, will be able to prove and demonstrate that the idea works. For the larger awards, the transition to scale um, stream, reviewers will look at uh, the proposed plans in terms of um, achieving scale and sustainability and that includes any um, commitments from, from key stakeholders and any partnerships that will help um, get it to, to that stage. For both SEED and TTS transition to scale um, applications, reviewers will also be looking at um, whether there is a connection to, to any private sector partners. Um, they'll look at the strength of the plan to monitor and evaluate um, the, the work. They'll look at um, whether there's consideration of gender um, uh, considerations, environment, human rights, um, and whether there's a, a sufficient risk mitigation strategies in place. Um, the next category is all about the, the team um, behind the project. So is the project leader and the key team members appropriately trained and experienced enough to carry out the proposed work? Um, also, to what extent have they demonstrated that they can draw on the expertise of um, other humanitarian actors um, and also potential private sector um, collaborators? Um, and have they demonstrated um, an ability to understand the needs of affected people in the context? So again, this, this comes back to the point that we, we would like to give preference to to projects that are locally led by people from the communities that have um, experienced conflict setting. The, the last area of, of criteria for the evaluation here is value for effort. Um, so this is um, really about is the, the proposed work um, uh, aligned with, with the funding that's being requested? Is it reasonable um, and is it a thoughtful and efficient use of funding. So um, just a note here that for the early stage seed um, applications, we're looking really for a basic overview of the project spend. Um, and should you um, succeed and move to um, the next stage, we would, we would then um, work with you to, to finalize a more detailed budget um, for the project. Um, for transition to scale, once um, we're past the concept note stage, um, a more detailed budget will be requested then. And again, we would work with you to refine that um, later on. So that's kind of a, a summary of, of the, the criteria and, the, and the, the, the way that we um, rate uh, proposals. So really what's left now is, is for you to, to apply. So the deadline is November the 16th um, and all applications must be submitted through our online application portal, which is called um, Flux. Um, so we won't accept any applications by email. It, it must be submitted through the portal. And you can find instructions on how to create um, an account um, for the portal to, to be able to access the application form. But the, those instructions are online um, within the request for proposals. Um, also a note that we can only um, accept proposals in either English or French languages. Um, we're not able to um, accept any other languages and, and those that are received in other languages will not be reviewed. <coughs> um, another um, point to note is that um, an organization, so um, 
the the institution or, or company that you work for can submit multiple applications but what we do ask is that each one must have a unique um, person as the project leader so an individual can only be the lead on one project um, but your organization could potentially submit multiple proposals with different project leaders again i'd encourage everybody to review the full request for proposals very carefully before you commence your application um, and uh, and that can be found on our website um, the address on the screen there and um, you know, as you are going through um, the, the application, please feel free to, to contact us with any questions. So if we move to the next slide, um, we have um, a couple of email addresses to, to point you to. So for any questions related to, to your proposal um, and, and the request um, that we put out, um, the email address there is info at humanitariangrandchallenges.org. And then if you have uh, any questions related to the application portal itself, so more around technical support, then the email address there on your screen is uh, fluxsupport at grandchallenges.ca. Um, and again, the, these um, email addresses are uh, included on the request for proposals, which is on the website. Um, so that's kind of concludes my uh, summary of of the of the challenge and the request um, that we put out um, so i think now we're going to um, take some questions um, through the through the chat um, here on on the zoom meeting so um, what i would um, I'll, what i would like to do is go through um, questions and and um, ask that you keep them maybe general and relevant to, to all of the the participants on the call um, and if you have very specific questions about your proposal itself and I would encourage you to email those um, separately. Um, so Allah, I don't know if you want to add anything else at this point. Uh, no, um, this is perfect. I would like just to thank you, Patrick, for the very informative uh, presentation. And it's a very good, pro uh, the, uh, the, the most important thing that I have noticed actually, that you are looking for good ideas and workable ones, and not only workable and, uh, but meaningful. Meaningful means that it is really delivering the services or the outputs or the, the to the most vulnerable and those in conflict and to make it to make sure that it's impactful and the impact creates sustainability and i'm so happy to see this again from grand challenge canada this kind of for different layers of evaluation and uh, this means that you are looking for thoughtful ideas and actually behind any good proposal is a thoughtful idea this is a general uh, 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 theory. So this is what you are looking for, and it's interesting that you have this all transparency and trans accountable uh, process uh, for people to uh, be attracted and to th actually think of solutions for those people in need that we would like to serve. And here is a partner that can partner with you and support you from the seed stage until the scheduled stage. Go ahead, Patrick. Just uh, read the questions and go ahead with that. You have you have 19 questions actually. There is someone who's raising his hand as well. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go through some of the questions that have come through on the chat here. Um, so uh, let's see. So we have one from Mohammed Aslam. Can an NGO apply for both innovation and TTS? Um, I think perhaps you mean can they apply for the seed and TTS stream? Um, so um, yes, as I mentioned. Um, just towards the end of the presentation there. An, an organization such as an NGO can apply, can submit multiple applications across both streams. Um, what we do ask is that um, the project lead, so the person who is um, really um, leading that, that application is unique for each one. So again, an organization can submit multiple uh, proposals under either stream. But the project leader, so the person who is who is leading that project, must be unique. Um, so I hope that answers that one. Um, another question from Patrick Esty: uh, How many projects will be funded in the seed funding and scale stages? What is the average amount that has been funded previously? So yeah, good good question. Um, so for the this round of funding um, for the seed stage, we're looking to fund uh, up to fifteen projects 
Um, and for the transition to scale stage, um, we can fund up to eight projects. Um, so to give you a bit of a sense of uh, how it's looked in, in previous rounds, so we've received over 600 applications in each round. Um, and um, really we've funded around about, I would say 25 for each round in total. Um, so out of over 600, 25 have received funding. So that gives you a sense of the, the level of competition and the, and the, uh, the success rate, but I, I, I hope that doesn't discourage you. Um, uh, but that gives you a sense of the numbers. So 15 to seed under this round, up to eight for the transition to scale stage. Um, Elizabeth Filippouli, um, what classifies under life-saving information? So for this one, um, it's, uh, as I said, we're looking for um, innovations that can help with um, two-way communication between humanitarian actors, um, so responders and the communities that they're responding to. Um, so, you know, what we funded previously are often um, technical um, uh, innovations around how to capture uh, feedback from the communities and process it in a way that it can be acted on. So, you know, um, we've seen apps that are, are gathering information and, and maybe translating them from um, local languages to languages that um, humanitarian actors can, can process. Um, we've also seen how uh, there's been other things that we've funded, um, technical solutions around um, sort of early warning systems. Um, so we've had innovators who um, have provided a service to the communities to warn them about um, potential airstrikes um, in the area ahead of time so that they can um, get to safety. So it's that communication between humanitarian actors and the communities that, that we're serving um, that we're looking for. So it's quite an open, broad scope for life-saving information. And um, again, in the request for proposals on the website, it, it talks a bit more about that. And you can also look through some of the um, things that we funded previously also shown on our website to see what types of things we're talking about. But, but really it, it comes down to that two-way communication thing. Um, and we're open to any kind of new innovative ways of, of achieving that. So Patrick, for their warning system, uh... This warning system from strikes should this should be very scalable to the MENA region now. So it should be working in Yemen, should should have it in Libya and Palestine. Is this right? <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're already working in in Syria this particular project and um, have recently um, started uh, moving in, into Yemen as well. So yeah, very uh, very uh, prominent work that they're doing. Perfect. Go ahead. Um, let's see. So from uh, Saeed Sabri, how is the eligible organization that can apply, can a private sector organization be a co-partner? So yes, absolutely. We, we encourage partnerships with the private sector and, and um, really we are interested in, in new ways of providing humanitarian aid. And one way that we see is that um, if we can engage with private sector actors, that can help um, move things more sustainably and more quickly through through the system, you know, making use of, of the private sector's access to markets and the distribution networks that they may have um, can really help accelerate um, the impact of a project. So um, can a private sector be a co-partner? Absolutely. A private sector organization can also be the primary um, applicant. Um, we're very interested in projects that that bring in um, the private sector um, into humanitarian aid. Um, Raymond Khan, any specific countries that would be considered or prioritized? So we do have a list um, of countries um, included in the request for proposals. Um, so, you know, it, it has the kind of, uh, I guess the major um, conflict affected regions that you would expect to see in there, such as uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, the list is there on, on the website. But we deliberately try not to be too um, restrictive around that. Um, what, we, what is important to us is that the innovation is serving uh, communities that are affected by conflict. So we, we, we look to um, the applicants to really 
give a compelling story of why this community is affected by conflict and why uh, your solution can help them. Um, so um, we do have a, a list of countries and, and encourage you to have a look at that and to get a sense of what we're interested in. But the key for us is that the communities that are being served are um, conflict affected. And this could mean people that actually live within conflict zones. It could also mean um, refugees who've, who've left a conflict affected country but are still in need of humanitarian support. So um, again, encourage you to read through um, the, the definitions that we have on, on the website. Um, but I hope that, uh, that helps with a bit more context there. Uh, Imad Hussein, regarding health, uh, can electronic medical record system be considered as an innovative idea? So um, absolutely, you know, in, in many of these contexts, um, the medical records system is, is failing or in some cases non-existent. So if there is a creative way to, um, to, to create a robust um, medical record system that's going to um, improve the lives of the people in, in those regions, then we would be open to, to considering that. Um, it would need to be something that's an improvement on what exists already, um, and um, we, we'd, uh, we'd look forward to, to reading any proposals that have ideas to, to do it better. So just going through, I want to make sure we, we pick up on some questions that, that uh, may be relevant to, to others. So can you give a sample, this is from Tahani Abbas, a sample of your project, please. So um, as I said, it, I, I would draw your attention to the website, which has um, a profile on, on all of the things that we've funded to date. Um, and that would be your best um, resource to see the types of things that we've funded previously, uh, which may um, get uh, some some ideas flowing um, for your for your application. Uh, so, from the Arab Women's Organization, um, could an intergovernmental organization apply for grants that you offer? Um, so, we essentially we encourage applications from all types of organization, and you'll see see that. Um, in, in the request for proposals. Um, so in, in some cases, it may be difficult for us to fund government um, actors. Um, so, uh, you know, often if, I, I would still recommend submitting a proposal because sometimes we may, need, we may be able to go through um, another partner that you may have um, to receive the funding if it becomes a problem um, with, the, with funding the, a, a government uh, type of organization. We also um, know that for, for many um, United Nations um, types of organizations, it's difficult for them to accept um, the terms of our agreement. Um, so what we suggest again is that um, applications should, should come from a partner who is maybe a local partner who can um, receive the funding and then the, the UN or the intergovernmental organization can act as a collaborator on the project. So not necessarily the direct recipient, but someone who is acting as a partner um, for, for a local organization. <clears throat> Mohammed Aslam, uh, when we speak about private sector engagements, um, profitability comes in, how do you do this? So um, it's, it's a good point, I think, um, when we talk about private sector, you're right, people often think about profit. Um, that's not necessarily what, what we're, we're saying here. Um, I think what we're talking about really is um, sustainability. So um, how is a project able to continue and to continue to be successful once our dollars have, have been spent? Um, so in that sense, you're talking about are there other partners who can then provide funding or support or resources beyond the funding that we provide. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily the case that um, 
a revenue generating project is, is what we're interested in. What we're, we're more interested in is something that can be sustained um, uh, on a continued basis for as long as the, the solution is needed. Um, sometimes that might be profit making and sometimes you know, the buyer um, may not be the, the end user, so the people who are affected by conflict uh, may not have you know, the, the, the money or, or the availability of resources to, to, to pay for a service, but a humanitarian aid organization might have those resources. So, you know, um, actors who uh, international um, non-governmental organizations might be the buyer for your solution. Um, so you would receive funding to sustain the, the work that you're doing through those buyers and not necessarily through the through the community themselves. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit in, in framing that. Um, but again, uh, there, there's more on this on online um, by what we mean by private sector engagement. Uh, and again, Tahani, um, yeah, do projects cover Sudan? Yes, we, Sudan is, um, again, um, somewhere that we, we have funded um, previously and um, is still a relevant context for us. Patrick, we have about 50 questions in the questions and answers section. Do you see it? Uh, okay, yes, I see it now. But this, uh, is, this is 50 questions, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I would say then, if I don't get to your questions, apologies <laughs> for that, and, and please do email us after this call so that we, we can um, address your question. I'll try and get through some of these now. Um, okay, so um, an anonymous question, would access to higher education be considered under life-saving information, or are you looking for items related to health? So. Um, what I would say is that we're, we're, it's not necessarily related to health. Um, so um, in that sense, it, it, it's, it's fairly open. But what I would say is that we, we aren't really um, interested in funding educational programs. So, um, you know, if it was a pure, purely an app that is, is providing education, it may not be something that we're, we're interested in. I think it's more around um, Sort of um, critical um, areas, like I mentioned, the uh, early warning systems for, for airstrikes, that type of thing. Um, uh, so I think purely educational um, projects are not um, really the the, the aim of, of the program. Um, Uh, Rana Dajani, how about solutions that are holistic and therefore may target uh, more than one of the categories at the same time? Absolutely, we know that, um, you know, for example, uh, a life-saving information project may be related to health and that's, um, that's wonderful and we, we expect there to be overlap between these things. You know, there may be um, a project that provides alternative energy uh, for a hospital. So again, there's a link to, to health as well we absolutely encourage solutions that, that can be across all of these sectors. Um, so yeah. Can the proposal be a capacity building with end result being creating jobs for vulnerable groups, for example? So um, I would say that uh, creating jobs is certainly a way to, to improve the lives of, of people who are affected by conflict. Um, and, and we do fund um, projects that that is one of the outcomes is, is to create, create jobs like that. Um, what I would say again is that um, it would still need to be related to one of the four um, categories that we're talking about. Um, so, um, so yes, creating jobs could be one um, positive outcome from an innovation project, but again, it must relate to the, to the areas that we're interested in. I 
I've answered some of these already, so I'm just going to scroll through and pick out some more. So from Hannah uh, Kuvalainen, um, do transition to scale projects uh, have to be funded previously? Um, sorry, I think I've lost that on my screen. I think you were saying, does it, for transition to scale, do they need to be funded previously by us in order to qualify? So the answer is no. Um, what it has to be is, is a, it doesn't need to have received funding from us previously, but what it does need is to have been um, proven and have sufficient evidence that it works um, and is ready to, to be scaled up. Um, so there's no restriction on, on applying it, even if you haven't received funding by us previously. Uh, Maria Kozachenko, is Ukraine eligible? Again, um, we do list some countries on, on the website. It's really up for the applicant to, to persuade us that the area that you're looking to work in um, is a relevant context and that the population that you're working with is, has been affected by conflict in some way. Uh, from an anonymous attendee, will you fund an organization that has not worked on humanitarian causes before? Um, what I would say is that at the seed stage, um, you know, these are, these are early stage projects in, in development. And um, I think perhaps um, at that stage, we, we would be um, open to considering an organization that maybe doesn't have that experience yet, um, but is looking to, that has a, a really innovative idea and that maybe they can partner with organizations that, um, that do have uh, experience in humanitarian causes. Um, I'm just seeing some other questions. So um, in, the, in the chat from uh, Nuha Yaferni, um, how about interventions focusing on reinforcing services on mental health and psychosocial supports? Um, yes, that, that would certainly fall under the, the health um, category um, for this call. Mental health is obviously a very um, relevant and needed um, service for the conflict affected community. So that, that would be something we would be interested in certainly. And just again, apologies if I'm, I'm missing your question. I'm just trying to um, manage the, the multiple questions that are coming in. And uh, we, we can certainly take questions by email um, as well uh, after this call. Actually, Patrick, all these questions are uh, recorded and registered at uh, the Zoom, and uh, we uh, uh, we can send you the list of all the questions have been asked. But still, it's, mm -hmm. these are a lot. Um, so I think I prefer what Patrick has just mentioned now that uh, uh, everyone who has a specific question directly go to the at the info at and uh, the the emails are listed in the grant in conflict uh, creating hope in conflicts and grand challenge. Challenges Canada and directly ask questions, uh, but Patrick, because Patrick is doing, trying to find the most uh, most repetitive questions up, up on demand, so to be able to uh, to uh, to answer as much as he can. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Allah. Um, so another question from Patrick SD on um, uh, when will the funding start? So um, what we are um, scheduling at the moment is that projects that um, succeed through this call, whether it be uh, at the seed stage or the transition to scale stage, will commence in summer of next year. So the, um, the review process 
takes us through to uh, around about March um, 2021. And at that point, we will then inform the successful applicants and then enter into a grant negotiation process. Um, and that typically takes around about three months to complete. Um, it also includes developing project budgets, uh, developing um, milestones um, and agreeing to milestones over the, the project period as well. Um, so, uh, and, and again, these timelines are laid out in the request for proposals. Um, but we, um, so March would be the time when um, successful applicants will, will be notified and will move through to um, finalizing the, the agreement with us. And then in the summer of, of 2021, the project will commence. Uh, Rem and Khan, do projects have to be only service delivery or are research projects also considered? So um, we're, we're not, uh, we're not really in the business of funding purely research project projects. We do want to fund projects that uh, will go into the field and will be um, implemented um, with within the communities um, that, that are of interest. Uh, Sarah Gallagher, are organisations eligible to apply if they already have CCC funding? Yes, uh, you, you are still um, able to, to hold a grant through this programme if you already have one um, through another or, um, uh, and um, what I would say, it, it would probably come back again to what I was saying earlier about an organisation can submit multiple um, applications but the, the project leader needs to be unique um, and able to uh, kind of commit sufficient time in, in proportion to the activities that they're, that they're proposing. So Sana Shahid, if an organization is submitting more than one application, do they need to be submitted from the same account? Um, so each project lead would need to create um, an individual account um, in order to create the application and then we would link you to uh, the, the same organisation when we process that. A uh, couple of questions from VJ. Um, first one, seed innovations in conflict, can they be tested in some other place uh, for the seed proof of concept stage? Um, so, you know, primarily we're interested in projects that will be tested in conflict settings. Um, and if something um, has already been tested somewhere else that's not conflict affected, we would still want to see that tested in a conflict zone because there may be very different considerations um, and contextual differences that, that can really change the way something is delivered. Um, so our primary interest is, is indeed to fund things that, that will um, ultimately reach a conflict setting. There may be an initial stage where it's tested somewhere else in a more stable context to first um, figure out um, uh, ways of, of implementing the project, but then ultimate goal is to bring that to a conflict setting and, as I say, to adapt to um, some of the very different um, contextual uh, things that, that happen there. I think I covered the question on numbers, so looking to fund 15 C projects through this call, up to eight transition to scale. Um, it, are the numbers that we're we're looking at right now? Um, so again, so Joseph, uh, do we submit the proposals for seed and scale up by November sixteenth? Yes, that's the that's the submission date, um, the deadline to submit your proposals. Um, just again, I'd like to clarify the difference between seed and transition to scale, um, the two different streams. So um, for seed. Um, you will submit uh, a full application form 
um, for transition to scale, slightly different process where it's an initial um, application form, a short form, and then the ones that rate the highest will then be invited to submit a full um, proposal. So slightly different um, process for the two streams and, and please do read through the instructions on online um, before you commence an application. But yes, deadline again is November the 16th um, for submissions. So a question from Belinda. Um, you've mentioned that capacity building may be funded, but the RFP seems to take the, the opposite. So um, I think what I'd like to clarify is that we, we're not interested in purely capacity building projects. There must be a link to um, the, the core sectors that we're looking at. So um, I guess one of the, the best examples there would be um, capacity building for health um, care providers. Can, do you have a new way um, to, to um, strengthen uh, the informal and formal health um, sector workers um, and, and build their capacity that can lead to ultimately to um, impact in, in health outcomes for the population? So purely capacity building, we may not see as being innovative, but is there an extra um, thing that's different about um, the way you propose to do it? um that uh that that really um makes it something new and, and innovative but purely capacity building i don't know if we would consider that to be truly innovative things like educational programs it would have to go beyond that to be something that um, we would fund um, maybe time for one or two more um, So Patricia Storcher, um, can I talk a bit more about private sector involvement? What types of entities would be considered as private sector? So um, yeah, very good question. Um, we, when we talk about private sector engagement, um, as I said, we, we feel that the private sector may have certain um, capacity that the public sector may not have. So distribution channels, as I mentioned, marketing, um, uh, expertise, that type of thing that can help elevate a project and maybe um, bring it to a population more rapidly than the existing system. And private sector can be anything from, you know, a local um, business um, in the region where you're working um, that can help with, with uh, distribution or, or manufacturing to, to, you know, a larger um, tech company, for example, that can help develop an app or something along those lines. So, um, there's all different ways to, to interpret the private sector engagement, but ultimately we, we, we're interested in, in ways that can help accelerate um, uh, an innovation impact um, and we feel that private sector could be a good channel for that. So Allah, I think we're at time now. Um, I'd like again to just thank everybody for, for attending and and um, for your questions. And again, the, the email addresses are available. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out with questions um, by email and, and we'll do our best to, to support you um, through the application process and look forward to, to seeing and receiving some really innovative ideas that, that can really improve the lives of people who, who are affected by conflict. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, so, thank you so much, Patrick, for your very innovative, uh, very informative, uh, sorry, very informative uh, presentation, and that uh, capacity to be able to handle all such questions uh, lively, and uh, and I just I would like to thank everyone, and I think this is uh, 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 still we have a one month. Uh, everyone has a one month for uh, applying for a, for a proposal. Still, you have time, and Grand Challenge Challenges Canada, I think, is ready for. If you send an email to them and you start discussing your ideas, maybe uh, there will be kind of, kind of understanding and give you an answer for your all inquiries. Uh, they are looking for good partners, I believe. And uh, you guys, NGOs, local, local, international, local NGOs in the region and the world, also looking for good clients. So good clients with good partners. Uh, this will be a great equation. 
So read the, read, the, read the between the lines, understand the request for proposal and come up with your ideas. And uh, I hope that this webinar is helpful. And by the way, just to let you know that the recording of the webinar and the presentation will be published by Grand Challenge Canada on their website, as well as it will be, will be published on Derby website. And uh, so you can revi review it and listen to it at any time you want. So it could, could help you more in writing a responsive, uh, 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 compliant uh, proposal. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Ala. Thank you, Ziba. And uh, thank you, all the attendees. Thank you so much. And have a nice night from Cairo. <laughs> thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.